While sometimes it is blatantly obvious when we should not take to the sky as butt fan people, more often than not, we are left scratching our heads or hoping that conditions are good. As the old sayings go, there is no hope in aviation and this sport is as safe as you make it. While there are a number of variables that you directly control to ensure safety in the sport, Mother Nature is not one of them. Sorry to rain on your parade. Which is why we, as ultralight pilots, need to have a close relationship to Mother Nature to better understand her and when it is safe to fly. This video, while remaining very basic from a meteorology perspective, is designed to give you more confidence in choosing the right flying days for your personal location. But this is where I come in with the disclaimer, guys, to say that I do not hold a certificate that makes my weather word golden. Weather Weather as a concept at large is a very complex subject that I only claim to know a very minutia within. This subject, as it pertains to paramotor pilots specifically, has very little coverage on YouTube. So my goal is to share with you my own experience and the knowledge that this experience has earned me to hopefully provide you with some value as a paramotor pilot. Without further ado, allow me to blow you away with what I know about weather. I'd like to start off by having you imagine a rapidly flowing river and how in some places the flow of this river changes, noting how this change is indicated visually. As newer paramotor pilots, it's better to prefer the easy, smooth going current with our fabric skyboats than that violent whitewater. In air, behaving identically to a fluid, this analogy will hopefully help you understand the following concepts. Starting with the factor of knowing your wind speed and direction throughout the vertical profile of your atmosphere. Expanding on our wind speed factor for a second, we need to know the variability of this before clipping in. A good place to start is any forecasting app that will tell you the steady state winds as well as the wind gusts. The app that I'll be using and presenting in this video is called windy.app. Just a heads up to you guys, while forecasting can be a good tool to use to give you an idea of when you should head out to the field, only by actually getting out to the field are you going to have an accurate reading of what those winds are doing. Only by clipping in and kiting, or better yet, hand kiting if you're unsure about the winds, are you going to get a really good reading on what they are actually doing. But starting off in our app, we're gonna go ahead and compare the steady state winds to the wind gusts. So since as ultralight pilots, we are flying so close to the actual wind speed itself, if the wind speed gusts more than five miles per hour greater than the steady state winds, it can cause some really uncomfortable flying conditions. Our glider is always seeking an equilibrium airspeed. In other words, an airspeed where that glider no longer needs to pitch forward to speed up to catch or slow down to find. Let's say for example that our particular wing wants to settle in at 25 miles per hour given the trim and motor setting. So if we are heading into a steady five mile per hour head wind and we catch a 15 mile per hour headwind all of a sudden or a 10 mile per hour gust, now our wing is flying at 35 miles per hour. The glider wanting to settle down at 25 miles per hour is going to do this by pitching backwards, swinging us out in front of it. And at this point, since that wing is pitched backwards and slowing down so much so abruptly, it's now actually slower than its equilibrium airspeed. Say it's at 20 miles per hour and now it wants to pitch forward to catch back up. But while you're at it, Murphy's Law demands that as soon as your wing is all the way back here, that wind gust is done. And now your wing is going 10 miles per hour when really it wants to be going 25. So it's gonna really shoot forward. And this is why we wanna pay attention to our wind gusts. For a smooth, comfortable, selfie taking flight, we want our wind gust variability to be five miles per hour or less. In addition to this speed variability, we also want to pay attention to direction. If your forecasting app is showing a wind shift of let's say 90 degrees, you should not be expecting a very comfortable or smooth flight. Just like with the wind gusts, with a direction shift, we can still expect an abrupt oscillation with our glider. And this is especially important for you beach flyers out there where conditions can change pretty rapidly, sending you out to sea in some mad turb, yo. So 
a good threshold for wind direction variability is no more than 30 degrees. By the way, this is during your anticipated flying window. Depending where you are geographically, you can anticipate the wind will shift more than 90 degrees at some point throughout the day you're really looking at your specific flying window. So as I mentioned before, we also want to monitor these changes vertically. So looking at each altitude level, the change in wind speed and direction variability. Let's say that at 20 feet, my wind is blowing at eight miles per hour out of 180 degrees, but then at 200 feet, my wind changes to 90 degrees and now it's blowing at 30 miles per hour. We should not be expecting a smooth flight at this point as the whole atmosphere is getting turned up by the abrupt change, even from 20 feet to 200 feet. That's still a pretty short distance. The threshold here in most places, and I will emphasize most places because this is not true where I am, a nice flight will include no more than 15 miles per hour all the way up to 2,000 feet with a direction shift no more than 30 degrees. The more terrain you're flying around, the tighter your tolerances need to be. But as an example, my flights over the San Juan Mountains near Telluride, I needed very, very tight tolerances due to the peaks that I was flying around. So for me personally, my tolerances were three miles per hour. I was not going to fly in anything greater than this out of fear of the mountains eating me. Again, that's with my experience, my knowledge, my understanding, and my comfort level all of which are really key points to keeping a pilot safe in the sky. Another thing to point out on these flights over the San Juans was that I was in the air before the sun was, and then I was on the ground very soon after. The more directly your solar rays are impacting a surface, the quicker it is absorbing and then radiating that heat. Take solar panels, for instance. This means that thermals will begin forming and winds start to generate as soon as that sun comes above that horizon. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into more detail and imagery on thermals. If you imagine for a minute a boiling pot of water, you have those little tiny bubbles that begin to form as soon as you turn on the heat. This hot air wants to rise. It wants to come up to the surface, but it's held down by cooler water above it. Once and only once enough of that cooler air has decided to join the party downstairs, will they bring that party to the roof. Generally speaking, there does need to be an outside influence like an angry Karen to get that rager to move. Could be wind, could be a slope, or just too much heat for this bubble to handle to stay glued on the surface. Something to note is that thermals require an uneven pattern on the ground. So think about a Walmart parking lot with that black top. It's actually generating all that heat in one specific area, allowing this bubble to form. On the other hand, if you have a big enough body of water, you will not have solar heating happening on random spots on that water. It's all just one big surface and it's not enough to generate heat to actually make a bubble to form a thermal. The reason why I am going in depth on thermals is because of Newton's third law. And this is what makes thermals potentially dangerous for the unexpected. As this warm air is flowing upwards, cooler air around and adjacent to it is actually flowing downwards to fill in the gap that that warm air is left. And hearkening back to my river analogy, if you have flow going in two different directions, you can imagine that between those directions is something that could potentially flip your sky boat over. And depending on the strength of said thermal that's going upwards, in extreme case, take you all the way up to the brink of our atmosphere. I've linked a paragliding miracle in the description below, but it features a very fortunate lady that was taken up to, I think, 30,000 feet. She passed out and actually came to again when she was still in the same cell spiraling downwards. How can we tell if thermals are actually in existence? How do we know if they're popping off? Well, we know that as air gets warmer, its moisture holding abilities increase. And as our little baby thermal bubble on the surface begins to expand and rise and generate mass, so too does the moisture content. And when that thermal does break off and separate, it'll start to rise. But for every 1,000 feet, the air cools three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And at a certain altitude, the air temperature reaches what's called the dew point, 
where any moisture is forced to condense, forming a cloud. Now, while a rectangle is a square, a square is not a rectangle. All clouds are condensed moisture, but not all clouds are the result of a thermal. All cumulus clouds are formed by thermals, carrying moisture up from the ground in a process known as convection. And early on in a thermal's life, these cumulus clouds are fairly small, more like bits of popcorn popping up here and there. While this is indicative of gentle thermals that are still safe to fly in and around without really noticing it, it is mother nature's gentle nudge on your shoulder to say, hey, things are picking up around here. It might be time to start heading back to your landing zone unless you're trying to thermal. If you are somewhere flat, say Florida, where when the sun rises, it's not really hitting the surface at a direct angle, you can get away with flying maybe three hours or four hours after sunrise and still be perfectly safe. But again, this depends on the terrain you're flying in and around, the time of year you're flying, whether it's overcast, pressure zones, and so on. You'll learn to study your local climate, and over time you'll get a keen sense of when your flying days are good and when they're not so good. I sincerely hope you're finding this video useful. Don't forget to bump that like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're looking forward to more content just like this. So danger also lurks on the other side of the convective period. As all of that warm moisture that was being lifted and carried upwards is now allowed to fall back down to earth. As this moisture falls, it actually displaces air, and in the case of an evening thunderstorm, this can be a lot of air all at once. This downpour of water is like a big rock falling in a smooth pond, and as it impacts, it creates this tidal wave of air that spreads in all directions outwards for quite a while. You can use any radar app to give you a good sense as to where and when these gust fronts can occur. My trick is to take the longest width of a cell and multiply that distance by three away from that cell to tell me where I am safer to fly. But if there are multiple cells close together, I will include all the cells in a row in that initial measurement length of my cell. I personally have been caught in an evening gust front that was a result of a long frontal line of storms about 80 miles away off the coast in Florida. It's not very fun to fly in, and if you do not take a careful, thorough look at your data, you could be sorry. So this was part one of a two-part video series discussing weather. In the next video, we're gonna discuss geography as well as more of a macro idea of what the weather is doing with pressure zones. Go ahead and jump into the comment section with any questions, concerns, snide remarks, or just general thoughts on your perspective with weather. And if you would, share this video with a fellow pilot who might be benefited by a little extra knowledge and information and help spread this word of safer, smarter flying to the community at large. Last but not least, a quick shout out goes to all of these guys right here for keeping me off the unemployed list. They've joined the Lifted PPG Patreon Club, making this content possible. And if you're still watching this video, you're an absolute legend. Thank you for tuning in. This is Lifted PPG. My name is Micah Stevens. Don't forget to take that deep breath and we'll see you guys in the next video. Cheers.